Welcome back to another episode, you beauties. Today we have a very fun episode for you guys as one of our boys, Jimmy Hockey, hops on the episode with us. We really hope you guys enjoy the entire episode. Thank you guys for watching and listening. We'll see you guys in our next episode. <laughs> McDavid ended up getting his 1,000th career point. Uh, I believe he is 27 years old, fourth fastest in NHL history. And who else than to get the apple than Leon Draisaitl? It's fitting, honestly. And we're right now we're witnessing probably the greatest player that has ever walked this earth in the game of hockey. And I think it's – this is ridiculous that I saw something after this happened. Is that So McDavid is 27 years old, and out of – Every active player in the league right now, he is, I think, eight or nine years younger than the next close. Actually, sorry, he's seven years younger, and John Tavares is the next youngest at 34 years old. With over 1,000 points? Yeah, that's active. Yeah, that's no, Mc, no, McDavid's insane. Like, I think it's safe to say he like, over-exceeded his hype. I remember his draft year, like, teams were tanking for him openly, like the Sabres and Maple Leafs started tanking at one point for him. Edmonton gets him the lottery. And I remember the hype around him. I think he's exceeded that hype. I know he still hasn't won a cup yet. He'll get one. But he's he's just ridiculous. Like, he's easily the best player in the world. I mean, he, I think he's already had a Hall of Fame career and he's only 27 years old. I mean, who knows what this kid's going to do next? Yeah, like, I completely agree. If you take a look at the other guys who reached 1,000 points before him and even the top 10, they're all from the 80s. So mm -hmm. we're talking about generational talents with this generation like Crosby and Ovechkin, not even coming close to what McDavid's done so far. You're right. The knock is he hasn't won a cup, though. That's what's separating him from all-time greats. But if you separate team accomplishments from individual accomplishments, it's hard to not say McDavid could go down as the greatest player to ever play in this league. Just oh, I 100% I agree, yeah. Yeah, you, you just got to separate those two things. It's a team sport, and I know people are really always about, it's about the cup, it's about the cup. I'm sure McDavid will say the same thing, but we're literally witnessing potentially the greatest hockey player to ever play in the sport, and it's beautiful. And going back to the team and individual accolades, like – he has everything in his trophy case except the Stanley Cup and a Calder. And the only reason he didn't get the Calder was because he missed half the season due to a collarbone injury. He lost to a 27-year-old rookie. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is complete bullshit. I'm not saying Panarin didn't deserve it, but the fact that he was that old and won it is I don't think he was 27. I think he was like 24, yeah, he, 25. I think, I think he was but, like 24, 25. The cutoff yeah. is like something like that. Um, yeah. But – like, with McDavid, he has multiple hearts, multiple Art Rosses. Um, he got a con smite, and he lost in the goddamn finals, for crying out loud. Like, that hasn't happened in decades. So, like, we're looking at a guy that right now, if, if he got a cup, I know I play a lot of if ands, or buts on the podcast, but if he got a cup, he would be in my top ten all time already. And that's just how good of a player he is alone. Like, if this dude goes out and wins two or three Stanley Cups, like – you're going to be comparing and past Wayne Gretzky. They're, we're going to be looking on this in 20, 25 years, whatever, with our kids or whatever is going on. And it's like, you guys don't know how good McDavid was back then. Like, how we talk about Crosby now is going to be how we talk about McDavid down the line in 30 years. The thing that amazes me about McDavid is he kind of just chooses whether he, like, wants to be a goal scorer that night or he wants to get, like, three assists. Like, I, he can dictate how he wants to play. Like, last year, he had 100 assists. He's like, I'm not shooting anymore. He literally said that. I'm not going to shoot. I'm just going to pass. And, you know, he can also score. He won a rocket with Shardy. at 64 goal, goals a couple of years ago. So, he can, he can just do whatever he wants in the ice. It's insane that you're at the highest, best league in the world, at the highest level, and you're, you're making it look easy. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, he's genuinely just set himself apart from everyone in the league. And you can look back at decades and there was always conversations about the GOATs. And I think Alex Ovechkin is a good player to compare to him. Look how long it took Ovechkin to win mm -hmm. his one and only cup. Sometimes it's not about championships. It's just about who you are as a player. And if he can get one, I think there won't be a lot of debates about his greatness. But I do think that not having that Stanley Cup is a big deal, despite the fact that we love his individual accolades. I think he'll eventually break through. I just am not convinced it'll be with the Oilers. I think this will probably be his best shot this and last year. And then 
we're gonna have to really start considering the fact that he might not play with the Oilers forever. That that, yes. that would be crazy. Yes. That I mean, would be crazy. You have the Dry Sidle's extension yeah. kicks in next season. McDavid's due after next season, so he's due for an extension this summer. Bouchard's contract is due up soon, mm-hmm. and then you add in Darnell and Nurse for the next couple of years at nine and a half. Like you're you there's I'm sorry, it's not winning hockey when you have to pay four or five guys nine, ten plus million dollars. We see it with the Maple Leafs right now. They have their core four plus Morgan Riley and it hasn't worked out and there's a reason why. Like you have a sixty goal score, you have three one hundred point scores. And it still hasn't worked out. There's a reason. So I, I don't know. Yeah. If I'm the Oilers, I do literally whatever I need to do to get Connor McDavid. But on I, I think I don't I, care if I play with ten forwards the whole season. They're, find they're, a way to keep McDavid. They're also yeah. I don't think is a comparison for the Oilers what they're about to go through with cap situation compared to everything else. A the cap is going to be going up, which is going to help them. Now, granted, you're going to have to pay McDavid whatever he wants. Doesn't matter. But two, like. Connor McDavid, I think at some point will probably be able to single handedly win the Oilers a cup if he ends up staying on the team. It's gonna happen at some point. It's it's just gonna be due. Like whether let's say he signs an eight year deal with extension with the Oilers, whatever. At some point, I would expect him to get a cup in that time frame. If he has to play with broken limbs, he's going to do whatever it takes at some point. Yeah, just one more thing I want to touch on his contract, and then I don't know if Jimmy has anything more to add for McDavid, but I could totally see him taking a team-friendly deal. Like, maybe like I, I actually Cross don't. We had. Oh, you don't? I, I don't know. I, I, don't. I feel like yeah. if, he wants I to win Edmonton, I, if he wants to win in Edmonton, I think he'll, he will take a d- team-friendly deal. I, I guess the way I look at it is if Connor McDavid re-signs, he's going to sign for his market value because the contract he's on right now is a team-friendly deal. We all can admit that, right? The mm-hmm. past – whatever eight to 10 years he's been with Edmonton, he signed the deal right as a rookie, like Mm -hmm. immediately. So he's been taking less money than a lot of other guys. I don't think he's going to take any less than what he's currently making. And to me, that's not a team friendly deal alongside dry settled nurse and everything else we talked about. It's basically the equivalent to the Toronto Maple Leafs, like Zach was saying. And I'm not saying that McDavid won't be able to win a cup in Edmonton. I just don't think we're going to see McDavid and dry settle win a cup together in Edmonton as currently constructed with the amount of other players to have on the books. They have to get rid of that nurse contract. And that means they're going to have to give away assets to get rid of that nurse contract. And I don't think they have it to like the assets to back that up. I don't think you can move that nurse contract. Yeah. It's unmovable. That, yeah, yeah, that's one thing we've preached on here multiple times. Like uh, that nurse contract is quite literally killing their Stanley Cup dreams. Like if if you even if you, even if it's at six million dollars, which I think is still an overpay, I, that three three and a half million dollars is so huge. You have so much more money to play with. So that that's gonna be a hinder on them. I still can't just believe a, they gave Nurse that contract. Oh. Yeah, and just think about it, fellas. The past two years, two years ago, Ryan Nugent Hopkins has a career year 100 points. Last year, Zach Hyman over 50 goals. Neither time it got done because of those two players. So you're not going to get anything better out of those two players. They're both going to continue to regress. So what's the ceiling for this team? If it wasn't last year with the defense playing at its peak, with Stuart Skinner playing a brand of hockey that he's just not worth, I'm – I'm just not thinking this team's going to reach that level again. Even if they do have a really good roster around all those pieces, if they don't play up to the potential, it's not going to happen. It's a team sport. It's unfortunate. But it'll be interesting yeah. to see. It'll be really interesting to see what happens with the Oilers. The Boston Bruins right now are playing at a level which I don't think anybody expected them to. Now, I get they went out and they ended up trying to fill some holes. Like, they ended up getting Lindholm. Um, they ended up getting Zadorov. I know you lose DeBrusque, whatever. Um, but this team right now... Outside of David Pasternak is not producing. You only have two guys on the team over 10 points, Marshan and Pasternak, the usuals. And then you go down to the goaltending, which I think is a big problem this year. You had the entire whatever with Jeremy Swayman in the offseason, which, by the way, great contract for both teams. I don't know why you couldn't do that July 2nd. Everybody expected him to get eight and a half, and it didn't. Whatever. That's besides the point. Right now, he's at a 3.35 goals against an 8.88 save percentage, and his goals saved above expected is some of the worst in the entire league. So there's something going on here in Boston. They're still lacking that true number one center because right now I know it's early, but Elias Lindholm is not getting the job done. Um... I, I don't know what's going on with this team. If they get the third seed in the Atlantic, it's strictly because Buffalo, Ottawa, D- Detroit, and Tampa are way too inconsistent to get that third spot. 
Yeah, my thing with Boston is like they they just they have a bunch of middle six and bottom six forwards on their team. You know, outside of Pasternak, who's an elite forward, uh, you know, Marchant's still producing for his age, I think, pretty well. But you know, outside of that, I think you got a bunch of bleh in in the middle of that lineup, and they don't really have any depth scoring. And you can overcome that if you're getting elite goaltending like they have the last couple of years. And Swayman has looked really bad this year, and Corpusalo hasn't been much better. Yeah. And uh, I actually think for Corpus Allo, especially considering his numbers from last season with Ottawa, he's playing fairly well for a backup goalie. And if you watch Bruins games, he wins most of his games because it's almost like the defense is playing up for him, like you usually see when teams have their backups in that. But with the Boston Bruins, I would say you can look back on a couple different events as the downfall for this team. Number one, everybody knows the 2015 draft. You pass up on players like Matt Barzell, Kirill Kaprizov, all, yeah. all these guys who you had with three first-round picks. But let's say that was a decade ago, so it doesn't matter at this point because they have had success. Three forwards who I think this team completely fumbled, Tyler Bertuzzi, Taylor Hall, Jake DeBrusque. You went out in the offseason, you brought in Nikita Zadorov because you're scared of the Florida Panthers and you think that he's going to be the answer when it comes to the playoffs, up to physicality and allows you to not let guys like Sam Bennett walk all over you. And unfortunately, he's been a disaster. He leads the NHL in penalty minutes. He is just not getting their system. And it's honestly looking poor on the goaltending and on Jim Montgomery, but it's really just his inability to step up, Charlie McAvoy's inability to find his offensive game and Overall, the defensive core is just in shambles when that wasn't the area you needed to fix. You had one of the best defensive cores in hockey last year. You needed wingers. You needed centers. You get Elias Lindholm, who is a borderline top line center, and then you don't address your top six. Like you were saying, they just have a bunch of middle six guys spread throughout their lineup. It's it's more management's fault than anything else why the Bruins are struggling right now. Well, yeah. I completely agree with you, yeah. You yeah, can't no. go into this season expecting to be contenders expecting to see Justin Brezzo be this top six goal scorer you can't go in with Mason Lorai out there which by the way Bruins fans love Mason Lorai I love Lorai but he is so so young and I think he has a lot of potential and then you have how do you pronounce um is it Matthew Portras is I I Patras. Patras, okay. Patris. Matthew Patras, which I think is a great player, but so, so young. So you have some of these guys which you have outside of Pasternak and Marchand. Like, I think Elias Lindholm is a second-line center or could be a 1B. We saw it last year when he got dealt to Vancouver. He thrived in Vancouver, and it's not because – maybe it's because of the system or whatever and his skill set, but also because he was able to take a back seat and be that second-line center that he's meant to play. Like, he's not supposed to be this top – center line driver where he puts up 85 90 points a season outside of one season which he played in calgary when he played with johnny Goudreau and that i mean that crew. that year that like that entire calgary flames team yeah everybody never put up better seasons besides that yeah it was a movie that year for sure and I, I think a big thing for the bruins too is like i was saying with their defensive unit a lot of these top line guys like poshnock are down in production lindholm's down in production because their power play sucks and it's because of their defense. McAvoy can't do anything, and Hampus Lindholm's now hurt. He was playing well in the power play for a minute. And if you look back to when Lindholm was with the Canucks, look at their two top blue liners. It's Quinn Hughes and Hironik, who are offensive units. They drive the power play and mm -hmm. set guys up, and you're just not seeing that in Boston. So when you're taking too many penalties, your power play can't get going, and you blow third period and second period leads to inferior teams. And then the next game get blown out by teams like Dallas, who are just a class above you. This is how you end up 500. And like you said earlier, the only reason they're even in playoffs is because every other team in their division just can't seem to figure out their own shit. So it just ends up being a mess for them. So the Bruins right now, I'm huge on special teams can win you hockey games. Their PK right now is currently ranked 26 at 74% and their power play is abysmal at 9.1%. That's dreadful. 9.1% yeah. is dreadful. Yeah, I mean, Jeez. that's the difference in winning and losing a lot of games. Like, I know we talked about the Oilers a little bit earlier, but their power play last year carried that team. They carried them all the way to the cup final. Like, if you have good special teams, that can make a huge, huge difference. Wasn't their penalty Especially, kill in the playoffs, like, disgusting? Yeah, they had a really good penalty kill, too. I think, didn't they set, like, a record for the most, like, penalties killed in a row or something, something like that? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, exactly. you're not... if you look at those um sorry Preston, if you look at those numbers right there, tell me, is Winnipeg the top in the power play? 
Um, I bet I'm betting Winnipeg's killing at above yeah, a 35% they're at, success rate. Yeah, they're rate. at 38%. Yeah, that's how you know. Special teams wins you hockey games. When you got a team like Winnipeg who's just killing it on the power play, look at Boston. That's how you look at the opposite when it comes to the teams. And the fact that the Bruins are even 500 with that kind of power play is actually more impressive than you would think because 9% is ridiculously low. I think it's a, uh, is that the worst in the league at 9%? Yeah, they're 32. They're, they're yeah. 32. Wow. Holy shit. 30 the Sabres second. even have a power, better power play than that. That's pathetic. I mean, the Sabres power <laughs> play right now is 22nd at 17.3%. It took them like double, man. It I took know. Them like eight games to score a power, power play goal. I mean, but Jesus. when when you're having a tough time scoring five on five, you need that power play to step up. And you know, I I'm a believer that if you get a power, if you have a really bad power play, it takes away momentum. Because even if you don't score on a power play and you get a lot of pressure, that can swing momentum your way. But if you're getting nothing done and you can't enter the zone, you're killing all your momentum, and it takes away the whole point of a power play. You're I mean, hundred percent. Hold on, where's Boston? Okay, so their expected goals for is like around the middle of the pack on five on five at fifty point fifty point one two. I don't know. So going to their five on four on the power play, they're thirty second in the league, of course. And then on the penalty kill, it is twenty third. So like even if those are still middle of the pack between fifteen and twenty two, I think Boston's in much better shape. They might have a nice cushion in the Atlantic Division, like. I, I think it's a combination of everything. Team defense in front of Swayman. I think it's goal scoring. I, I, it's just, at this point, everything. Because right now, through 18 games, they have 45 goals for and 61 goals against. Which, right now, is not a recipe for success. Which is obviously... I mean, it's insane the that they even are in a playoff spot right now with that goal differential, negative 16. I mean... Yeah, if I think the, I think the team that has the best chance to push Boston at three spots probably Tampa Bay, but they're also pretty inconsistent. So we'll like, see. I, I wish that this like we've talked about this Atlantic Division is going to be like a bloodbath, but like I'm seeing more like a mid off like we saw at the end of last season because like now you eliminate a team that is a powerhouse. You don't have a certified top three teams like you did last season. You have Florida, Toronto, and after that we're gonna see. Boston, Tampa, Ottawa, Buffalo, and Detroit win every other game and lose every other game and get that third spot with like 86, 87 points at this rate? Uh, I don't know. I mean, Toronto and Florida are clearly the best teams in that division. Then it's just everybody else. Yeah, for real. And I think if you look at like a good comp for Boston this year, if you guys remember the Capitals last year snuck into the playoffs with like Mm -hmm. the craziest goal differential and their power play sucked. Their penalty kill sucked, and they had like one or two guys who were just playing well. That's the Bruins this year. Pasternak, maybe it's going to be Marshan, and they're just going to ride into the playoffs. And if they do get in, it's not going to be a fun series to watch. If this is the team they're looking at, I love that. Yeah, and somehow they'll still be Toronto and seven. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) If they do get that, but uh, if you look at it. uh, uh, a thing that's big right now is Jim Montgomery doesn't have a contract, which is why people are trying to scapegoat him. So the, the one thing you can keep an eye on for the Bruins, either they got to trade one of these players or you're going to see Jim Montgomery get fired pretty soon. So if I think that'd be a get mistake. It one or the other. You think it'd be a mistake to f- fire McGon- yeah. I think he's a good I, coach. I think he's one of the best coaches in the league. Yeah, it's I think so too. It's on management here. I mean, it, it's like a lot a lot of times head coaches get scapegoated for how the team performs on the ice. Sure, maybe some of it's it, but also you have to put out a good product on the ice as well. Yeah, Bruins shouldn't have won against Toronto last year. They shouldn't have had the second best, almost best record in the Atlantic last year with that roster. I think he's a great with he's great with the young guys. He holds the stars accountable like he did with Pops in the playoffs. Marshan at the start of the year. I think he's really good for the team. I just don't think they put the right pieces around them. I think he's made something really special out of these very subpar rosters, at least the past year and this year. Their 2022-23 roster was stacked. So, I mean, mm-hmm. anybody probably could have coached that team, so. I want to pivot over to the Montreal Canadiens because right now I feel like they're just below expectations. They're currently last in the Atlantic Division, which is what we all expected, but they're 5-10-2 for 12 points, 17 games played at the moment. And at this rate, I'm starting to kind of think if the Canadiens should try and hurt for Higgins and try to get that first overall pick this season because, granted, I know the um, Canadians already have a bunch of goal scorers, whatever, but you add in another guy like Higgins into your four core, into your top six to nine, whether he plays next season or not, whether he comes into the league or if he stays in college, whatever. Like, the Canadians have a bright future. We see it on the blue line. We see it up front. We even see it with the goaltending. But right now, like, 
Caden Primu has a goals against of almost five. Montembeau is at a three and a half goals against average. Like, I'm I hate to break it to Canadians fans, and if there are any listening or watching this, I'm sorry, but the Canadians are still probably three or four years away, rather than just one or two years away from truly being in a competitive spot to make the playoffs. I don't know about three or four years. I mean, I think their goaltending needs to be better. Their defense is still pretty atrocious. But, I mean, I really like the forward core they're building. And they're not scoring is not going to be an issue for them in the near future. Yeah, I also think it's going to be tough to kind of tank, if you want to say that, with two of your top guys who are coming into the season, potential of Patrick Laine. He should be coming back pretty soon. I don't think his injury was as serious as they thought. You also have your stud defenseman, younger guy in Rhinebacker, who's – missing about two months, three months of the season, he's going to come back. If the Canadians can just somehow get themselves to being a 500 hockey team by the time those guys come back, maybe there's going to be a spark. I just don't know if adding more goal scoring is going to do much. I mean, this is the core of your team. Cole mm-hmm. Caulfield looks great this year. I think he's leading the NHL in goals, mm-hmm. which is a positive sign. Uh, it seems like St. Louis is getting the best out of him. I just think you got to figure out if this core is going to blend well together. But you're so right. They're still young. Stavkovsky's only been in the league like two, three years. Cole Caulfield, Suzuki only been in for four to five. I think people are just always so optimistic about this team because they went on that run in the bubble. And now it's just like – That was a mistake. That, yeah. that, that, that yeah. was me- completely misled expectations. That was Carey Price just trying to get a cup before he retired. Absolutely, yeah. And it just kind of set up – set us. A- to rebuild a little bit where people were like oh they're they're there Caulfield's arrived Suzuki's arrived this is the team and it just hasn't been that their defense similar to other teams like the Ducks just isn't up there yet there are a lot of young guys people still learning and like you guys said they're goaltending it's just not it's not the way to go right now so they got to improve a few things but I could see them being competitive in like two to three years but right now I just don't see them being a playoff team I think they're on the right track they just need to keep building get to better defensively yeah I, I agree with you with the forward core I think it's pretty much set. You just got to see how they play together. I mean, make a couple additions to the bottom six. I mean, we'll see how they look like when Lion A comes back out. That I mean, they're a lot of fun to watch, though, regardless, because they're high-scoring games because they can't play defense and they can score a lot of goals. So, yeah. Cole, Cole. And the potential of Lion A, 40-goal 40, 40 scorer, he's mm-hmm. only 26. He fits their timeline. So I got to see how he comes back and looks before I can make a clear yeah. judgment about them being able to get the first overall pick. And Cole Caulfield's looking like he might actually have 40 goals at this rate. Oh. Like he might, he honestly has the potential to hit fifty goals. Like I don't. Okay, well, I don't know. No, what's... the pace is sixty right now. He's it... on pace for sixty. So forty is an understatement. He's already got what thirteen and. I think he'll get forty this year. Games. He, he might get healthy, forty yeah. by mid by early February at this rate. Well, I think forty yeah. is the minimum I'm setting for him right now. If he keeps playing like this and he stays healthy, I don't see a reason why he wouldn't hit forty goals. And even yeah. let's say like you guys brought up good points about they don't need a forward, another forward to add to the score, which I completely agree with. Even if let's say things do go horribly run wrong or they jump up like five, six spots and get the first overall pick. You could always trade it too. That's always an option and trade back for a D man that you like to put into your prospect system. Always an option too. The Minnesota wild, this team right now, there's, they're not slowing down at all right now. They're currently second in the central division with 11, two and three record for 25 points, 16 games played. And the only reason they're not first near the division is because they are behind the Winnipeg jets, which are absolutely ridiculous right now at 15 and two. They have a potential hard trophy run winner. Matt Boldy and Marco Rossi are having huge steps. Matt Boldy is looking like a potential breakout candidate for over a 75, 80 point season. Granted, you lose Zuccarello to IR for the next three to four weeks, but it's okay because you go down to their goaltending and Philip Gustafson in 12 games, he has a 208 goals against average and a 924 save percentage. And that's absolutely absurd right now. Yeah, the one thing I would like to see from the Wild a little bit more, though, is maybe a little bit more production from their depth. You're getting, obviously, extraordinary play from Kaprizov and, of course, Gustafson as well, like you mentioned. But with Zuccarello being out, he's your third leading point guy right now. And outside of that, everyone else is below double digits. You're not getting a lot of production from your depth. So let's say Kirill Kaprizov slows down a little bit and maybe Gustafson hits a little bit of a rough patch. What's this team going to look like? Are they going to be able to pick up on the offensive side and maintain that, I think, People are so quick to say that Winnipeg's riding is high, but I think 
Maybe we got to pump the brakes a little bit on Minnesota as much as I love the success they're having. I would like to see them get a little bit more consistency from other players and not just ride on two guys who are single-handedly carrying most of the team. I do like Boldy, of course, so I think he's been really nice as well. But I do think a lot of his success and some other guys in the top six has been built off Kaprizov just being so great to start the year. Yeah, no, Kaprizov is ridiculous. 30 points already this season in 16 games is kind of insane. I mean, I think this team is overperforming a bit right now. I think they'll come back down to earth. I still think they're a playoff team. They should. I think they should be a wild card team at the worst. I mean, I don't think anyone's catching the Jets in the, the Central Division right now with the way they're playing. But, uh, you know, Minnesota was a team, you know, we talked about a lot during the offseason, me and Zach personally. We got roasted by a lot of people for thinking that they could potentially be a playoff team this year. Um, glad that they're proving us right. By, uh, I was surprised they didn't make it last year, man. I had the wild in the play. I think this team is so much better than people actually yeah. think. I think Gustafson just had a really bad year, and the defense was a bit banged up, and they just they had an off year. It happens. I mean, you see it from a lot of teams. It's happening to Colorado this year through stretches. It, it's going to happen with teams, and I think they're just kind of showing us that they have the team that can be in the playoffs. But I feel sort of the same way I feel about the Jets when it comes to the wild. You can have a crazy regular season, but you don't do anything in the playoffs. So until you can prove me otherwise and at least win a round, that's something I got to see from this team, even though it is a kind of a brand new wild team than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. I don't know if the minutes, I mean, if Minnesota makes the playoffs this year, I can't see them making it out of the first round. But, you know, this team, I think, has a bright future, especially because they have the Parisi and Suter contracts coming off the book, not coming off the books, but they're getting like $14 million in cap space back from two, from dead cap. So they're going to have some money yep. to spend. All that uh, that money should be going all to Kaprizov, honestly. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> if, for sure. If, if he walks, they're done. Like they're they're done. Yeah, the I team mean, isn't good enough without him. So the team rides on Kirill Kaprizov, like you brought up last season, where they they didn't they it felt like underperformed expectation with injuries and the entire roster as a whole. And last season, Kaprizov to start the season up until January first, he he wasn't playing up to his standards. He was hovering around a point per game, but nothing like he is now. The team was skidding. And then the second he picked it up in the second half, they started winning hockey games. And there's a reason. And there's two guys right now that I would like to see more production out of with Zuccarello out is Joel Erickson Eck and Ryan Hartman. Those are two guys that you need to not only play some good two-way game, but also you need them to put the puck in the back of the net or just create scoring chances, do something. Because when Erickson Eck at the moment in 14 games has eight points, nothing too crazy, but for his standards, he needs to play better. And the same thing with Ryan Hartman, has an abysmal four points in 11 games. Now, granted, he has been dealing with an injury, but, I mean, if you're on the ice – you should be able to produce in some way, shape, or form. And you're not paying these guys to play that lockdown forward defensive role. You pay these guys to put the puck in the back of the net and agree scoring opportunities. So I, I kind of I'm kind of with you guys about them riding the high. However far Kaprizov takes them and Gustafson is how far they're gonna go. Like Lord only knows if Kaprizov, like you guys said, starts to slow down a little bit. Let's say Gustafson starts to slow down a little bit, they're gonna start losing some games because I think Neither of the paces that they're on right now are sustain, assist, Jesus Christ, sustainable, but I know it's only 16 games in. But, I mean, you never know. Like, we said this stuff about the Bruins start, and it wasn't sustainable, and look at them. They went on and had the greatest regular season of all time. Not comparing to them, not comparing them, but yep. I'm just stating. I think it would be uh, really nice to see Joel Eriksson kind of take a step forward this year. I think a good comparison for him would be the Mika Zibanejad and Rupe Hints of – the hockey world i think he's definitely capable of being around a point per game player and if he's going to kind of step up and be one of your better top six players i think you got to see a little bit more production from him some more impactful goals because just checking out some wild games he doesn't really score in big time moments it's more like garbage time goals garbage time points which it's fine it gets your stats looking nice but i would like to see him have a little bit more of an impact this year and Hartman as well, I think, needs to start getting going for this team to kind of be able to sustain this uh, winning culture that they've built to start the year. Goaltender interference, it's been a touchy subject all season. We saw two of them recently, one in Buffalo and then one, the Capitals against the Toronto Maple Leafs on Wednesday night. Because personally, I think both of those were absolute horseshit. Um, the Buffalo one, I believe, was called no goal after originally it was a goal because Bennington became... 
um, an actor and drew that shit. Deserves an Oscar. <laughs> um, I didn't see the Toronto against Washington one at all. I don't know if either of you guys saw that. Yeah, I saw a, a replay of it. I'm trying to remember. Look, I think it was Washington had scored a goal. And I think someone made like slight contact with, I want to say, the glove of Joseph Wool. And it might have messed them up a little bit. And they called that back. I, I could be wrong. No, no, you got it right. I, th- I think when it comes to goaltender interference, it always goes back and forth because uh, I don't know how big of history buff you guys are with the NHL, but a while back, this is how the NHL used to do it. If you had your foot in the crease, yeah. if anything was oh. wrong, the crease, it's a no. And I'm sure you guys have seen it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're Sabres fans. We know this one's yeah. personal for us. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys know how it works, right? So it, if that's how you're going to do it, at least there's some clear defined rules about what goaltender interference is. What I don't like sometimes about the rule is that it's more up for interpretation at this Mm -hmm. point. So if you're going to complain about how it used to be, it's hard to complain about how it is now. Um, As somebody who played a lot of goalie growing up and who's always been more interested in the goaltending when it comes to hockey, I just feel like if you're getting in the way of the goalie in any way, it's a problem. But if you're just being tapped in certain ways, like we saw with these past two goaltender interference, this is a judgment call. Like, look at the play and make a decision. Don't just do it because you're afraid of the backlash. Because one way or the other, somebody's going to be upset. And I just think if you can't make the right judgment call every time, then I think outside of a few because human errors there, I just think you need to define the rules a little bit more clearly. Same thing with offside. Like when we're doing these reviews and being able to check out this stuff, there needs to be some clear definition about what goaltender interference is. And I just don't think there is at this point. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I'd rather have them be like a standard set of costs. Like, okay, even if it's touchy, just call it every single time. So we don't have to yell about it anymore. Like you have some games where it looks a little bit more obvious that there's goalie interference and they call them good goals. And then, one where you like breathe on the goalie the wrong way, it seems like, and it's no goal. Like Bennington, I feel like he kind of put out a bit of an act. <laughs> he did he did get bumped a little bit, like, but it looked like Bennington initiated the contract. He looked like he pushed his shoulder up into Zach Benson. Zach Benson was getting pinched between Bennington and, and then I think it was Ryan Suter. Like he was like, Where I don't know where he's supposed to go. And he's getting pushed back by Suter into the play. And Bennington, like, oh, pops his shoulder into him and then he like slides around, like, oh my God, like I can't <laughs> skate anymore. Yeah, like, and compare that to some previous ones, man. Like, do you guys remember the Florida versus Boston game? Yeah. In the playoffs mm-hmm. Where that's not goaltender interference, but the dramatic performance, like you said, from Bennington <laughs> is considered something. And I think we all can agree a playoff game has more stakes when it comes to a goaltender interference call being made. And how you can decide that that one wasn't a goaltender interference, but then go ahead and call it on that Buffalo play. There's just no consistency. And like I said, there's human error because now we're making other people choose what the goaltender interference is. Um, and I just think they need to come up with a better like definition for what they classify as goaltender interference to keep it just consistent. I personally don't think it should really be challengeable. I don't really like the coaches challenge anymore. I think it, it like I get it. If like, it's something obvious, and I think at that point, if it's something super obvious, I think the NHL should be trying to take a note from the NFL and have like replay assist. Like the NFL has, has this is the first year they've done it, and I feel like it's made a tremendous difference. Where like if the refs make an obvious mistake, they get a call from like New York saying, "Hey, you guys fucked up, go fix it," and they go and immediately correct the play, and it doesn't affect anything. And in the NHL, like I feel like for the most part on offsides, they're pretty good about calling offsides. I don't know about that. I, I, I don't. I, don't know. I mean, there's, I'm there's on the opposite side of that. <laughs> there's some sure. instances of where it's, I don't know, so close for comfort. It's like at that point, like if it's so close, where at that point New York has to basically make a judgment call on it. Like sure, but I mean, like, like, like you guys say, it. We there just needs to be a consistency of calls. Like if it, if it's just like taps the goalie if it's some soft ass shit but it's called every single time personally i'm fine with that like, yeah i'd rather have it be consistent than guessing every single time and then taking 10 minutes to look at it yeah. it slows the game down but dramatically too when you're sitting there with a certain call especially a coach's challenge and by the way it's clear and obvious to us but the refs sit there talking to new york for about 10 extra minutes well, the thing is to. The refs aren't even the ones making that call, oh, yeah, it's really. New York. It's, it's, the it's, it's, it's the situation room in Toronto really making that decision. They're kind of just – the refs are talking through what they see. And, you know, I, I feel like once it gets to a certain point, it's out of the refs' hands. So there's not really a whole lot the refs can do. Well, yeah, I that's think. what that's what I'm saying is, like, yeah. why sit on the headset for an extra 10 minutes and when it's clear and obvious, but then they have – like, I get the – there's this whole, like, communication thing between the two. But, I mean, I feel like it slows up 
the game at some point. Like you well, mentioned, it's not always like, clear and obvious, though. Well, it's not always well, that's, clear. That's not my point, though. I'm saying like yeah. the clear and obvious ones, like they still sit there. Like if it's if it's not conclusive or if it's super close, like an offsides, for example, or if there's a one where a player gets pushed into a goalie, like bumped into it, and they don't know if they should call it at that point, it becomes a judgment call. Like by all means, I'd rather have you sit there for an extra 20 minutes and get it right than have them go rush to it and it's the complete wrong call. But that's just yeah, my point on it. I don't know, man. There's something about the goaltender interference seems a little bit more. You can make a mistake. You can make a judgment. For some reason, offsides to me is the one that I wish coaches couldn't challenge because I just feel like at this point, there's so many plays, exciting plays that they take away from the game for something, let's say, happens two minutes later. I feel like you could fix at least the offside ones by saying, if a minute passes and you're in the zone and a play hasn't happened, then you can't review the offside if there is no correlation between it. Because there's been so many plays where, like, you're seeing the pucks like this much yeah. on the line. It's like, a is human that really is not going to see that? Exactly. Yeah. So that pisses me off a little bit more seeing exciting goals get taken away from offside, where goaltender interference, there is a lot of gray area with some of it, where we see it just through the eyes of watching through TV or just as a fan. And there's always going to be some bias because no matter what game you watch, you're rooting for somebody to succeed. And there's always going to be something about that where I feel like goalies are being interfered with even if it's slightly it could change it because you guys know how quickly the nhl has played these shots are so quick that that little bump could really throw off anything uh whereas offsides i just feel like it's not the same thing and especially when we're reviewing it for 20 minutes and they're doing the frame by frame pixel by pixel and you're just like this is crazy it was two minutes earlier they've been in the zone for a while so yeah yeah I, 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 yeah, I think i'm just more annoyed with that than i am with goaltender interference at this point when it comes to challenging I mean, that's not a horrible idea because, like, there's been instances where a team controls the puck, not even being overdramatic, for four minutes of game time. And then they score a goal, and here comes the coach challenge for offsides, and then there's no goal. And then they have to throw four or five minutes back on when there wasn't a shot on goal until two minutes after. Like, what, yeah. are, we, what are we doing here? So what do you guys think of this? Do that because they do this with goals now. Like if a goal is un if the ref like waves off a shot on the ice and like it goes in and out of the net real quick and the ref isn't sure it went in, they wave it off. The NHL is allowed to call down a stop play to say, hey, that went in the net. You got to call it a goal. Should they allowed be allowed to do that for an offsides is missed? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And but I think it's got to again, it's got to be clear. I think if we're gonna be doing this review, I think every zone entry should be reviewed. And I think if there's a really egregious one that's like clear and obvious, you're offside, yeah. you're cherry picking, then sure, I'm completely okay with them calling down and being like, hey, this play's dead. Or if you don't use a coaching challenge, you let the play finish out. If they score a goal, they can call down and be like, hey, we're waving this off. You don't get the goal. We're just going to start from here and take it off. It get, does get tricky with that, but I just feel like the – the offside impact on a goal is significantly less impactful than it is with goaltender interference. And that ends up taking away just as many goals as goaltender interference does. I mean, it makes sense. Like with offsides, if it's egregious and then it's like a in transition on the rush and they score whatever, like by all means call it off. I don't really care. But yeah, it, there's a, there's a lot of more gray area to goaltender interference as more control over what happens in the play, especially if a goalie gets bumped and whether it falls down or he loses sight of the puck, whatever it may be. So I would be okay with doing all that for offsides, goaltender interference. I'm okay with still keeping the coaches challenge, doing whatever, because like most of the time, if well, not most, all the time, there's a goaltender interference. The puck goes in the back of the net. So I'm I'm okay with that. That's going to end it for today's episode. If you guys enjoy all of our content, all of our socials are down below. And thank you again for joining us, Jimmy. And why don't you let the audience know where to find you? Yeah, guys, you can check me out on all platforms. Just Jimmy Hockey on YouTube, TikTok. Instagram, Twitter, wherever you guys want to find me. Thank you again, guys, for listening and watching. Subscribe down below. Go check out Jimmy. His stuff's going to be in the description below. We'll see you guys in our next episode. <laughs>